Renaissance Baker. He's a well-known expert on the enemies of the states and the federal government. Allow me to introduce Trevor Loudon, who is traveling all over the country to present his findings. Let us give Trevor a special tea party welcome. Trevor, the platform is Well, first of all, um, I'd like to say thanks very much for coming here tonight. It's great to be in this area. I love Southern California. Um, I want to tell a little story before I start. I was up in Los Angeles not long ago, and um, I bought some food from a street vendor. I walked, he walk, I walked up to the guy, gave him the money. He said, hey, you've got an accent. Um, where are you from? I said, yeah, look, I'm from New Zealand. He said, well, where's that? <laughs> so to make it easy for him, I said, look, it's down near Australia. He said, ah, where Arnold Schwarzenegger comes from. <laughs> you got some problems in your education system, people. <laughs> now, people always ask me, they say, you know, why do I come to America? Why? I've toured all around your country, probably done 400 meetings. I say there are two reasons. The first is simple gratitude. You know, my country was saved during World War II from invasion by the Japanese, by the massive sacrifice of your fathers and uncles and grandfathers at the battles of Guadalcanal and the Coral Sea and Midway. And that's a very strong memory, people. The second reason is related, but it's a little more selfish. Ronald Reagan had it right. This is the last best hope for mankind. Clap on that. <laughs> if freedom should ever fail in, the, in this country, if you should ever lose your constitution, your liberty, your economic dynamism, and your military superiority, all of which took a huge trashing through the Obama years, if that trend had continued, people, we would be living in a world run out of Moscow and Beijing and Havana and Tehran. And is that the kind of world you'd like to leave to your children, folks? So I want to make a couple of questions. I want to make a couple of comments on the 2016 election before we go on. The first one is this. Does anybody think there might have been a touch of the miraculous about that election? Okay. I think even an atheist would have to acknowledge that. So, and this is how I see it, folks. If you go back to the Old Testament, there's a lot of second chances in the Old Testament. And I think we have been given our second chance. We would basically, we've let this country slide for 100 years. We're on our last legs and we got another shot. Well, how many third chances were there in the Old Testament, people? Not many that I remember. So I think we should take this chance very, very seriously. Very seriously. Because it's not, President Trump hasn't saved America. He has given us the breathing space for us to save America. Now another little comment on the election. The Germans, or no, here's the first one. Which, which state contributed more to President Trump's victory than any other. Which state in the Union got President Trump elected? It's California. It was this one. Because you guys had 335,000 volunteers here, 45,000 on the phone banks any evening, and you were phone banking into Florida, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and one other state. And you won all five of them out of California. <laughs> president Trump would not be the president today without the volunteers of California people. And I think you should be very, very proud of that fact because it's given us a lot of hope. The third uh, thing I want to say about the election the Germans have a wonderful phrase, word, it's, uh, it's called schadenfreude. And it makes, means taking pleasure in the pain of others. 
And it's not a very noble thing, right? It's not something you boast about. But I'm sure most of you watched election night, right? Did you, stay, did you remember the scene about 2 o'clock in the morning? Well, it would have been different for you guys, probably 5 o'clock. Whatever. They panned the Democratic Party headquarters. And those little snowflakes were bawling their eyes out and hugging each other. <laughs> did you feel a little bit of schadenfreude then, people? <laughs> and do you think after eight years of Obama trashing your country, you deserved it? Yeah. Well, please hang on to that feeling, folks. Because I want you to feel it again in 2018 and 2020. I do not want them feeling it. Do you? Keep it for yourselves. People will be very selfish about your schadenfreude. Okay? Now, I talk mainly about national security. But I talk about a, a, an aspect of it that is very seldom discussed in this country. Though I believe it should be. Any, I'm sure there's some military people here tonight, former military people. You know, you take an oath, you take that oath to defend the Constitution from enemies, foreign and domestic. domestic. Now, which are more dangerous people? An enemy over there in a uniform with a gun pointing at you or an enemy wearing a suit and tie in your Congress on TV talking to you? Which is more dangerous? Inside. Now, has anybody in this room ever had to undergo any form of FBI security clearance for a government or civilian position? Quite a few. You didn't pass, did you, Dick? Surely not. <laughs> well, is it true that they can be pretty rigorous? They check out your family background, overseas travel, criminal convictions, even bounce checks you know, drug habits, the whole lot. Because they want to know that you are going to be loyal, a loyal and faithful servant of the Constitution and that you can be trusted with responsibilities, maybe national security responsibilities in this country. I had a friend who applied for a federal government job in Washington, D.C. during the Obama era the FBI sent two agents all the way to Canada to interview my friend's communist uncle. On the strength of that interview, my friend was declined. He was not given the job because it was just too darn risky because his uncle was a communist. He wasn't, his uncle was, and that was considered too darn close. And I'll tell you people, I support that decision. Because you are dealing with the most powerful country in the world, a country that has enemies all over the place that know they can't take you down from the outside, so they spend millions of dollars every year trying to take you down from the inside. But what if you're a young Marxist radical who hangs around with the Communist Party or the Muslim Brotherhood? And they control the local unions and the local Democratic Party, which they do all over the state. You know, someone like Barbara Lee or Raul Ruiz or Judy Chu or Mark Takano or Peter, Ag Peter Aguilar or Nancy, Nancy Pelosi or even Dianne Feinstein. And you get elected to the Congress or this, even the Senate, where you may serve on the Homeland Security Committee or the Armed Services Committee, or even the Intelligence Committee of the House of Representatives overseeing all 16 of your intelligence agencies. How much of an FBI background check do you need for that one, folks? Zero. Nothing. Because the people are supposed to vet the candidates, right? And the media is supposed to help you, right? Well, how's that been working out for you? Can you see the problem there? Now in the movie we didn't get to see, but it's in my movie and I hope you'll get a copy or many copies, is Andre Carson of Massachusetts. Now Andre Carson is a Muslim, one of the two Muslims in Congress, and he is very actively involved in several Muslim Brotherhood front groups. Now the Muslim Brotherhood overseas is the father of Hamas and Al-Qaeda and ISIS. But here it works 
legally as CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, um, the Muslim Students Association, and several other front groups. Many of them active in this state, all around here, working in your school board, boards, working with your Congress. So we've got Andre Carson at a, at a Muslim Brotherhood front convention in 2012. And he gets up in front of the audience and he says this, I understand there are people here undercover watching us from the audience because you think we're here plotting to destroy this country. Well, I say to you people who are secretly watching us, Allah will not allow you to stop us. This guy serves on the House Intelligence Committee people. He oversees the CIA, the FBI, the um, NSA, the DEA, all 16 of your intelligence agencies. And he has never had a background check. Not one. Not one. Now, in your Congress right now, you have the Congressional Black Caucus. About 40 members. And that was basically set up by the Cubans to help the Cubans. And most of you of those members have gone to Cuba multiple times. Barbara Lee has gone more than 22 times that I know of. And they go down to Cuba on a regular basis to talk to the Castros, or the one, no, the one that's left, on how they can work inside your governments to get trade and travel restrictions lifted on Cuba so they can more easily send more spies and more terrorists and more bombers to your country and also ship in more drugs. They are the major supplier of drugs into your country. You know, the Cubans were kicked out of your country back in the 60s. And one of the incidents that provoked that was the fact that five Cuban agents were caught in New York with a room full of dynamite they were going to use to blow up Macy's on New Year's Eve. Think of what that would have done, people. And now, thanks to your congressman and your past president, many of those restrictions have been lifted. So the Cubans are going to find it much easier to instigate more LA riots and more Fergusons, to work more closely with Black Lives Matter and your local terrorist groups, and just create more mayhem. What do you call people who go from your country to an enemy foreign country to help them against you. And what's the, what's the penalty for that one, folks? So why is it happening every day and nobody says boo? It's been going on for a long time, folks. Any Vietnam veterans here tonight? You'd be too, you, did, you didn't serve there, you'd be in Korea, would you? Korea, well, thank you. Any Vietnam veterans here? Well, thank you very much, sir. I want to ask a couple of questions. One of them is very stupid, but I think you'll see where I'm going. Was the Vietnam War lost in the jungles of Vietnam? Is it true that your troops weren't really allowed to fight to win? You weren't allowed to invade the North. You couldn't bomb Haif, mine Haiphong Harbour. Your fighter pilots weren't allowed to shoot at the enemy till they'd been shot at first, hoping they would miss. Is any of that true? Well, here's the, dumb here's the dumb question. Did any of those rules in any way hamper your ability to fight and win that war? So had you been allowed to fight that war to actually win it, like you did in World War II, took the fight right to the heart of the enemy, do you think your troops could have won it and pretty darn quickly? Most veterans tell me six months probably tops. The country was the size of New Jersey. Could have won it easy. And it's also true that when your troops withdrew, that your Congress defunded the South Vietnamese military, guaranteeing a communist takeover. So you lost 58,000 young Americans in that war, people. Your high school buddies, your cousins, your church members, your football team members, your hunting or surfing buddies, 58,000 young Americans died in a war they were not allowed to win. I will say this, folks. 
that war was deliberately sabotaged in your Congress by congressmen like Father Drynan from Massachusetts, who was working hand in glove with the Communist Party USA, which was taking its orders directly from the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which was allied to the Communist Party of North Vietnam. Do you think there might have been a little bit of treason going on there, folks? And how many of those traitors who condemned tens of thousands of young Americans to completely unnecessary deaths? I'll tell you another example, people. At, during that war, you had a Secretary of State, a man called Dean Rusk. And every night he would get the bombing orders for North Vietnam on his desk, exactly where your bombers were going to fly. And every night he would send those, those lists to the, to the Swedish embassy in Washington, D.C., who would pass them on to the North Vietnamese. So they knew exactly where your bombers were going to go the next day so they could get their guns in the perfect position to take them out. How many of those traitors people who condemned tens of thousands of your boys to completely unnecessary deaths, how many of them paid a single penalty for what they did, folks? One of them was Obama's Secretary of State, a man called John Kerry otherwise known as Jane Fonda with less testosterone. <laughs> and one of them was a man called John Conyers. Remember him? He just left Congress, was there for 140, 160 years, I believe. <laughs> the longest serving member of Congress, and I regard him as the most dangerous and treasonous member of Congress you have had in decades. And the reason I make that claim is that John Conyers was the ranking Democrat on the Judiciary Committee, the most powerful committee in your Congress. And when the Democrats controlled Congress, as they did through most of his career, he was the chairman. He was the man who abolished your House Un-American Activities Committee, for example. He is also, and, and, and think about, he is also, well, go back, on the Judiciary Committee, you also have Judy Chu from San, Gra San Gabriel Valley, who was a long-time supporter of the Communist Workers' Party, a pro-Chinese Maoist group. She has been described in the Chinese press as China's best friend in your Congress. And you should see Judy Chu when the FBI arrests a Chinese spy in this country, of which there are thousands. You are racist. The FBI is a racist organisation. You're only going after this man because he's Chinese. You want to see her who go after him, after them. Look her, look her up on C-SPAN. And then you've got Jerry Nadler from New York, who's now the, has replaced John Conyers as the ranking Democrat on the committee. He was a long-time member of a Marxist group, Democratic Socialists of America. You've got a big chapter here in Orange County. Um, remember when ACORN got in trouble a few years back? You know, they were doing vote fraud and doing all sorts of scams. Well, there was going to be a congressional investigation into ACORN, but it got shut down by Jerry Nadler. You see, ACORN was a front for Democratic Socialists of America, and Jerry Nadler was a member of that organisation. How convenient. And what about Luis Gutierrez from Illinois? Mr. Amnesty, a long-time member of the pro-Cuban Puerto Rican Socialist Party, Marxist, but completely, completely anti-American, got elected several times in Chicago with help from the local Maoist communists, and was a very big supporter of the Council on American Islamic Relations, a front for the Muslim Brotherhood. And let's go back to John Conyers himself. 50 year history with the Communist Party USA, 40 years with Democratic Socialists of America, 30 years with the Workers' World Party, a party that supports Iran and North Korea, and an active supporter, again, of the Council on American Islamic Relations. Judy Chu is too, by the way. John Conyers is a hardcore 
anti-American Marxist Leninist. Yet he headed the Judiciary Committee. Now you have a body that's supposed to root the spies and terrorists out of your government. It's called the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Which congressional committee do you think the FBI answers to, people? The Judiciary Committee. So what do you think is going to happen to the FBI's budget if they ever start going after congressmen? The FBI has not investigated congressmen since the 1940s. At least. Yet your congressmen are going to Cuba, to China, to the Middle East, they are working with American Communists, American Muslim Brotherhood activists all the time, people. The Israelis just arrested a former Israeli cabinet minister for spying for the Iranians. Don't tell me high-ranking government officials can't be traitors, people. You have got at least 100 members of your house and 20 members of the US Senate, including both of the members from California, who are so enmeshed in neo-communism, Muslim Brotherhood front groups, or both, they couldn't pass an FBI background check to drive a school bus. But they don't need them, people. There are no checks at all. None. Do you think your enemies might be aware of that? Do you think maybe they might try and use it against you? Do you think they're so dumb and stupid and lazy that they don't? Now I want to talk next, and Dick has talked a little bit about this, about what I consider is the greatest internal security threat you face right now. And I'm not you know, downgrading North Korea or Iran or Russia or China or any of those. But the biggest thing that could bring you to your knees right now is illegal immigration. Now, this all started back in California in the 50s with a Communist Party member named Bert Corona out of uh, Los Angeles. He was also a big time Democrat. He set up the Viva Kennedy Clubs, the first organized effort to bring Latinos into the Democratic Party. He also trained up hundreds and thousands of volunteers or activists in Southern California, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, Texas, to basically carry on his work for him. What he did was set up with Saul Alinsky money, a whole bunch of, a whole network across the southern border states to basically encourage and enable illegal immigrants. And the purpose of these groups was to get illegals across the border, working in factories and farms, get their kids in school, get them settled, and get them voting legal or illegal now corona died in 2002 but he left a whole bunch of disciples behind him three of them are very active in your state you'll probably know their names they work closely together and they have transformed california you know that orange county was once the most conservative county in the entire united states folks can you boast that today changed a little bit hasn't it this is how it changed. The first of these three people was a man called Antonio Villagrosa. Thankfully, you didn't elect him as your governor, but he was the mayor of Los Angeles. And he was the man who basically forbade the LAPD from enforcing immigration laws, and that encouraged hundreds of thousands of illegals into, into LA and Orange County. The second member of this little group Remember that illegals got driver's licenses recently? That was done by a man called Gil Cedillo, until recently the Democratic head of the California State Senate, a longtime Communist Party supporter and a member of this little clique. The third member of this group, I regard her as the most dangerous woman in Southern California. She's a hardcore Marxist and a reconquista. She believes the Southern states should go back to Mexico. She served until recently on the Democratic National Committee and now she's running virtually unopposed for a state house seat here. Her name is Maria Elena Durazzo. She was the head of the California AFL-CIO. 
and she was behind the massive union-driven and union-paid-for Latino voter registration drives and get-out-the-vote efforts that added hundreds of thousands of new Latino voters to the California rolls in the last 20 years. These three people transformed your state people, and they're all communists, and they worked deliberately to do this. And also the first, their first victory was not far away from here. Who remembers old B1 Bob Dornan? You know, one of the most conservative congressmen in your Congress, uh, based out of Santa Ana area, I believe. Well, Loretta Sanchez and a whole bunch of communists came into that area in 1996, and they signed up tens of thousands of new Latino voters, legal and illegal. They did a whole bunch of vote fraud, and they just beat B1 Bob. And they gave you Loretta Sanchez, who uh, ran for your Senate last year and is thankfully out of public life. That was the first step. They replicated that model all over California, illegal immigration, massive voter registration drives, all orchestrated by the communists, and that is what has turned your state from purple to deep blue, folks. Complete, deliberate Marxist program, 100% deliberate. Now, the reason it's a national threat, not just a California threat, the man running the movement today, the amnesty movement, is a man called Alaseo Medina. He's a Marxist, he's a member of Democratic Socialists of America, and he served as Obama's advisor on all things to do with immigration. Now, any union, former or current union members here tonight? Anybody been in a union, is in a union? You know, it is California, I understand. So, cast your minds back, people. Look back 30 years. Which organisation in America 30 years ago, was leading the charge against illegal immigration. Against. Teamsters, Cesar Chavez and the farm workers, SCIU, the, the AFL-CIO. The AFL-CIO was constantly lobbying Congress to increase penalties on any employer caught employing illegal immigrants. Cesar Chavez had people on the border to keep out what he called wetbacks. That was his name for them. Cesar Chavez also had a woman working for him whose job it was to go out in the fields and identify illegals and turn them in to the INS. And that woman is today married to Alaseo Medina, the leader of the amnesty movement. Because in those days, their unions were strong and they didn't want competition. They didn't want undocumented workers taking their jobs, breaking their strikes, and lowering their wages and conditions. And as usual, the Democrats followed on with that. You should look it up on C-SPAN, the speeches that Bill Clinton and Harry Reid used to make in the early 90s, absolutely condemning illegal immigration as a national security threat, taking the jobs of American workers, a national disaster when it was a quarter of a million a year, maybe. So now, which organisations are leading the charge to legalise the illegals? It's the unions, people. SCIU, ask me, the United Auto Workers Union. They are supplying all the money and all the leadership to the amnesty movement, and they are the ones putting huge pressure on the Trump administration and the Republicans to buckle on DACA and other similar issues. So why did the unions completely reverse their policy, folks? It's very simple. Before 1994, American labor unions were led by people like, um, uh, I just forgotten his name right now. Sorry? Lane Kirkland, George Meany, who were patriots. They were, they were America firsters, and they wanted to protect their workers. But in 1994, there was a coup. That was the year Democratic Socialists of America, the Marxists, took over the AFL-CIO. That was the year they conquered the, the, the unions. And they completely reversed the policies. Alice o. Medina, the Marxist, got the unions to do a complete 100% reversal 
at their national convention and an ally in the year 2000 from completely opposing illegal immigration to 100% supporting it. 100% reversal. The big question though is why? Well, I've got him in my movie. I got him on tape saying this, so he can't dispute it. In 2009, Alice A. Medina, Obama's advisor, gets up in front of a big progressive gathering in Washington, D.C. and says this, passing amnesty for illegal immigrants is the number one, the number one priority for the progressive movement. And did he talk about, and then he said, he went on to say, we have to get amnesty and citizenship and voting rights for our 11 million undocumented workers. And did he talk about compassion or reuniting families or giving immigrants a break? Not one word, people. Look it up yourself. You can see him saying this. All he said was this. In 2008, Latinos voted overwhelmingly for Obama and progressive candidates. If we give these people citizenship and voting rights, they will stand with our movement. That will give us at least 8 million Democratic Party votes. That will give us a governing majority, not just for the next few election cycle, forever. Think about it, people. Mitt Romney lost by 2.5 million votes. Donald Trump won by 200,000 votes and actually lost the popular vote by 2 million. Just thank God and your founding fathers for the Electoral College is all I can say. There are at least 12 million illegals in this country, maybe as many as 40 million. If they get citizenship and voting rights, that is between 10 and 24, 25, 26 million new Democratic Party voters. How are you going to beat that, people? How are you going to beat those kind of majorities? They've already got California. They're on the way to getting Texas, and if they get Texas, you can kiss it goodbye. The two biggest states in the union with the most electoral college votes that can never, ever be beaten, people. Why do you think Hillary Clinton promised to legalise every single illegal within 100 days of taking office? You came this close, folks that close to losing your country forever last November. And I still think most of your base, 95% of the Republicans, have got no idea how come they close to losing this, how close they came to losing this. They had no idea. Blinded by the Chamber of Commerce money that wants unlimited cheap labour, they were going to go along with this, folks. Republicans would have sold you out. You came that close. So this is where we are, folks. You dodged a bullet. Miraculously, you dodged a bullet. You won the first game of the World Series. But you don't declare victory after the first game, right? You don't say, we won and all go home. What would happen then? You've got to win game two and three and four. And you've got to win them all in a row because you only need to lose one and the Democrats will amnesty everybody and you're done. We've got to win 2018, 2020 and 2022. At least we have to win those all in a row. Now, have you ever seen as much hatred and contempt and vitriol directed at a, at a president as this one? Even close? Reagan wasn't this bad. Bush too, it wasn't this bad. At least he had a little bit of bipartisanship, a little bit of, you know, reaching across the aisle. Who watched State of the Union speech when Trump gave a great speech? Well, remember when they panned the Democrats? Black unemployment's the lowest it's been ever. And the Congressional Black Caucus were scowling. Did you see one clap or cheer out of the Democrats? One? Is this the party of Harry Truman or JFK, folks? 
This is now a Marxist party, people, and we got to understand that. They hate the Constitution and they hate the American middle class and they want to destroy it. It's as simple as that and they came that close to being able to do it. See, they don't want to make your country like France, people, or Germany. They want to make it like Venezuela, then Cuba. That is what they want. So this is where we are. We got, they're absolutely hammering the president. So why do you think they're so hateful? Well, I think there are two reasons. The first is very easy to understand. On election night, the Democrats were so excited and so pumped. 93% chance that Hillary was going to win. It was all in the bag. They were just so excited. The first woman communist president. You know, it's absolutely true. And when it all started to turn bad, when Florida went for Trump and Ohio went for Trump, they're like a bunch of kids who thought they're going to get the biggest bike you've ever seen for Christmas, and they got a pair of socks. And they are bitter, and they are disappointed. But I think it's even worse than that. The real reason is this. See, if you're a Democrat, you think you own the white union guys in Pennsylvania. You think you own the black population. You own the Native Americans. You own the Asian Americans. And you own the millennials and the soccer moms. You own these segments of the population. That is your base. That's locked in. And you just try and bring a few people over, the, over from the middle to win the election. That's been their strategy. And they understand something that I don't think most of us understand. That if President Trump is successful, they are done. They're going to lose their base, folks. It's already starting to crumble. When President Trump went out to those white union guys in Pennsylvania and Ohio and said, I don't see a lot of factories out here, guys. I see a lot of rusty old shells. I see a lot of unemployment and meth and just... Why don't you vote for me? We're going to rebuild American industry. And a whole bunch of them said, hell yeah. And they abandoned a lifetime of voting Democrat to come and flick the lever for President Trump. They weren't voting for Republicans. They were voting for President Trump. And when he went into those black inner cities and said, I don't see what 40 years of Democratic rule has done for you people. I see a lot of crime and drugs and unemployment. Your young kids can't get jobs because the illegals take them all. Why don't you vote for me? What do you got to lose? And a whole bunch of them heck yeah, and they did it. And that is freaking the Dems out, people. Because their base, if Donald Trump is successful and keeps running elections together, their base will desert them. You're going to see a massive realignment in American politics. You will not see blacks voting 90% for Democrats. You might see them voting 60%. You'll see a whole bunch of Latinos come over. Come over. You'll see a lot more Asian Americans. You'll see a big realignment. And that is freaking them out. Because they were this close to a one-party state, and now they are that close to complete disaster. Do you see why they're so desperate? Why they're so angry and bitter and completely unrelenting? Because their survival is at stake. There will not be a Democratic Party if they keep losing like this. And everything they've worked for, for the Great Revolution, all those 60s radicals who joined the Democratic Party and wanted to see a communist revolution before they died, they're going to die unfulfilled. But the Democrats have a plan. And this is what it is, folks. I want you to listen to this very carefully because I don't think most of the Republicans understand what's coming at them. Now, who remembers the old Rainbow Coalition of the 1980s? Jesse Jackson, that great scamster. Okay. He, got, he ran twice, 84 and 88, for the president to try and get the Democratic nomination. He came third in 1998 and 1988 and got seven million votes. And his idea was very simple. You get the progressive whites 
You get the progressive blacks, you get the progressive Latinos, the progressive Native Americans, Asian Americans, gay Americans, Muslim Americans. So you got the green, you got the lavender, you got the yellow, you got the brown, you got the white, you got the black. This is how they thought. This is their terminology, not mine. Because if you're a Democrat, people are races. People are groups, they're not individuals, right? This is their own terminology. And he did very well. But he didn't make it, because in those days, the minorities were a lot less, right? So one of Jesse Jackson's key supporters was a young um, black radical at Stanford University. He was there most of the 80s. His name was Stephen Phillips. He was very closely affiliated with the League of Revolutionary Struggle, a pro-Chinese, ultra-militant communist group. Very militant. And um, they, uh, he also spent a whole year, he took the whole year off his studies and was Jackson's West Coast student organiser for the Rainbow Coalition in 1988. The whole Rainbow Coalition was completely run by Maoists. It was a complete communist operation from top to bottom. So in 1990, after Jackson sort of lost interest and moved away to other scams, they were sort of looking for what to do, you know. So they dissolved the League of Revolutionary Struggle and they most of them joined the Democratic Party. Steve Phillips became a lawyer in San Francisco and he married extremely well. He married into the one, uh, one of the richest left-wing families in America, the Sandler family from San Francisco. They got a $2.8 billion fortune when they sold their savings and loan and they put 1.6 billion of it into the progressive movement. They fund the Center for American Progress and ProPublica and a whole bunch of other groups. Now, so Steve Phillips was a Maoist communist radical moving up through the Democratic Party. But the big thing, he had a whole bunch of money to do it. Millions and millions of dollars at his disposal. So what would a young communist do with tens of millions of dollars? One of the first things he did was in 2008, he put $10 million into a sort of novice, unknown candidate out of Illinois. It was the first big donation that really got him known. He was Barack Obama. Steve Phillips gave you Barack Obama, people. And then he used that money. He set some organizations up like Power Pack and Democracy in Color. And he used that money to fund candidates of colour all around the country. This is his terminology, not mine. He funded Maisie Hirono, um, the, the senator from Hawaii, Tulsi Gabbard, Gabbard, the congresswoman from Hawaii. And right now he's funding um, several congressional uh, Senate candidates around the country. He's funding Andrew Gillum to run in the governorship of Florida, Ben Jealous in the governorship of Maryland, uh, David Garcia for the governorship of Arizona, and he just got Stacey Abrams by 77 to 23% to win the gubernatorial primary in Georgia. Plus, he's funding congressional candidates, um, state senate candidates all over your country. But he's concentrating his efforts a little bit. Now, Steve Phillips wrote a book. You can look it up online. It's endorsed by Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama called Brown is the New White. And he's got a very simple argument. Democrats, forget about the middle. Stop spending billions of dollars trying to get a few white people in the middle to cross over to the Democratic Party. Waste of time, he says. There are thousands, there are millions of black, Latino, Muslim and poor white voters in the southern states who don't vote. Go for them. Spend your money on Democrat organisers, voting registration, sweep the southern states, take the Republicans' base away from them in the south. Now, this group, basically they flipped Virginia in the last few years. Virginia was a solidly, um, solidly Republican state. Now it's almost Democrat. And that was done through a communist group called New Virginia Majority, funded through Stephen Phillips. Um, they put a whole bunch of money into Northern Virginia, signed up 200,000 new voters. 
They got 200,000 Fallons voting. They made a deal with the governor, Terry McAuliffe, and they gave him an award and, and hosted them at their, their anniversary dinner in honour of what he did. They got about 400,000 new voters for the Democratic Party and they flipped Virginia. Remember when uh, we had that little, little disaster in Alabama recently, the Senate race in Alabama? Doug Jones, a Democrat, versus Judge Roy Moore? That should have been a, a shoo-in for Roy Moore, right? Absolute shoo-in. But when leftist radical Gloria Allred went after him, and he got in a lot of trouble for his past alleged indiscretions, Steve Phillips saw an opportunity. So he put a whole bunch of money into Alabama. They reactivated the communist networks that had been there since the civil rights era. They set up what they called a vote or die campaign, and they signed up hundreds of thousands of black, Latino, and Muslim voters. And the head of CARE in Alabama, the Muslim radical group, boasted it was them that made the difference. They were part of this because the margin of victory was 20,000 votes and they claim they signed up 20,000 Muslim voters in Alabama and they all went for Doug Jones. Now they're pouring resources into Florida because Trump won that by 200,000 votes and 150,000 Puerto Ricans just moved in there. They're pouring huge resources into five states, North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Arizona and Texas. And Arizona is right on the edge, North Carolina is right on the edge, and Florida is right on the edge, and, and Georgia is trending blue. If they flip one or two of those states, people, or get a whole bunch more congressmen, we're going to have huge problems. Huge problems. You know, usually the party in power loses about 25, 30 seats in the midterm elections. Trump has only got a majority of 23 in the House right now. And they are pouring people into Arizona, North Carolina to flip as many states as they can. Many r congressional races. That is why your race right here is critically important. You may not particularly like the Republican candidate, I don't know. But you got to make sure that woman gets elected, folks. Because it could come down to two or three seats in the, in the Congress. And if Nancy Pelosi is back as the head of the Congress, your president gets impeached, there is no new legislation, and it's all over for the Trump agenda, folks. Every congressional seat counts. Every single one, folks. And this is ultra important where you are right now, because you've got one that's right on a knife edge. It could go either way. Well, I want to see it go your way, folks. I want to see you put everything you can into winning this seat. Now, so what they're going to do, the Democrats, they're going to play the Rainbow Coalition strategy in 2018 and 2020. They're going to run candidates of colour and they're going full on to energise the progressive black, Latino, Muslim American base. That's what they're doing right now, and they're putting millions of dollars into it. And George Soros just put $18 billion into the progressive movement, people. So they got all the money in the world to play with. And then in 2020, they're going to run the candidates that Steve Phillips has already picked out for you on the presidential ticket. Do you want to know who I think it's going to be? Sure you do. Well, back at Stanford University, and it all comes out of Stanford, there was a young black football player who used to hang around with the radicals. He went to England as a Rhodes Scholar. He wasn't one of the militant radicals, but he hung around with the radicals and uh, Steve Phillips and these people. And Steve Phillips put a lot of money behind him when he went into politics. That's Cory Booker, the senator from New Jersey, right? Already being touted as a presidential candidate now. You want to see the press, you know, but the one who's going to be on the top of the ticket, I believe, I think he'll probably be second. Maybe we'll see how it goes. Bernie Sanders may run, and if so, this person will be probably on the ticket below. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I guarantee Cory Booker and this other person are going to be up there. Now, at Stanford, there was a young Marxist radical woman there, and she left Stanford. She became a top uh, assistant to Hillary Clinton during the campaign. 
and her husband at Steve Phillips' recommendation was deputy to Eric Holder in the Justice Department. His name was Tony West, his wife was Maya Harris. You probably know her sister, Kamala Harris. She is going to be on the top of the ticket, maybe deputy under Bernie, but I am almost 100% certain she'll be on the top of the ticket. She is a complete and utter Marxist, and they are going to run the... See, this is their plan. Smash President Trump, divide his base, criticise him, impeach him, run him down, embarrass him, whatever you can, weaken him as much as you can, build up your base in those southern states so you've got millions of new voters, and then run Kamala Harris and Cory Booker at the top of the ticket in 2020, win with 51, 52, 53%, legalise every single illegal immigrant in the country, and celebrate the great communist victory over America. That is the plan. Does any of this sound too far-fetched or implausible to anybody? Like I'm sort of getting a wee bit too much out there? You look at the papers, Kamala Harris, she'd make a great president. Cory Booker, he's pretty cool, you know. You know, he'd be a new Obama, you know. Kamala Harris, she's tough, she's a prosecutor. They are pumping her up like you wouldn't believe. So this is where we are, folks. We've, got a, we've all got a personal decision to make. Look, I know, you Tea Party folks, you've been at this for years, right? You've been door knocking and phone banking and sign waving and getting behind candidates and donating money. And sometimes you get them elected and they disappoint the hell out of you. I know how tough the road you have. But I just want to do two examples of why I think you are the most important political movement this country has ever seen. And the fate of this country depends on you. I went to this progressive conference, the Institute for Policy Studies, a couple of years ago. I, I infiltrated, you know, and I was sort of there and I was thinking, wow, these guys are going to, they're going to discuss all this really deep stuff and all their plans, right? You know, these are commies. These are hardcore commies. And I'm going to learn a lot about what they're going to do. And I was so bitterly disappointed because all they did all day was bitch about you. Tea Party did this, the Tea Party took theirs off, the Tea Party stopped us there, we hate the Tea Party, we got to stop the Tea Party, blah, 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 Tea Party, Tea Party, Tea Party. They hardly even mentioned the Republicans, folks. They were endlessly bitching about you. And I'll give you another little example. I was, uh, went up to Washington DC about three years ago and I had a, a little meeting with Jim Bridenstine, I asked to see him. He's the very conservative rep from Oklahoma who's now heading NASA. And I said, what do you see the future? What do, what do you think is going to happen with amnesty? Because the, the Republicans, they had just got amnesty through the Senate. And they're trying to get it through the House. And the House was balking. And I said, Jim, what, what's going to happen with amnesty? He said, well, it's all over. The rhinos have got the numbers. They're going to vote amnesty through the House on Friday. This was about Tuesday. It's, it's done. It's a done deal. I got the numbers. They got all the numbers they need. They're going to pass it this Friday. And I said, do they understand what they're doing? This is national suicide. This is going to destroy the GOP. They said, well, they don't really think about that. And they get lots of money from the Chamber of Commerce to promote cheap labour. So they're going to do this. And I walked out of there very depressed, people, because I could see what was coming. But about two days later, something miraculous happened. 200 Tea Party volunteers with $200,000 in a district in Virginia were running behind a man called Dave Bratt against Eric Cantor, the darling of the house. Eric, you know, Paul Ryan's predecessor, top Republican, Wall Street guy, big time amnesty, you know, the man, he was the man. And he had $5 million to fight his campaign. And 200 Tea Party volunteers with 200 grand took him out by eight points. The rhinos freaked. Amnesty was dead the next day, people. Completely dead. The Tea Party movement has saved this country on multiple occasions. And I don't think sometimes you even realise the impact you've had.
You saved this country, folks. You guys. We would be communists by now without the Tea Party, effectively. So, that's where we are right now. I know what you do, I know how hard you work, and I'm sure a lot of you, after President Trump got elected, said, wow, last I can have a holiday. Well, I'm sorry, people. It doesn't work that way. When you know, you got to do. That's just what goes with the territory. So what I'm asking for you to do is just think of your children's future, think of your grandchildren's future, and decide whether winning 2018 and the work you're going to have to do, balance that out against your children's future, people. Balance out the checks you're going to write and the doors you're going to knock and the phones you're going to call. Balance that out against your children's future and make the decision on what you're going to do. Because you here in this seat may make all the difference. Remember the 500 hanging chads in Florida? How close it was? People, this election could be so close and it could come down to one or two congressional seats. Do you want to be the people who lose this one and we hand it back to the Democrats? Or do you want to people be the people who win this one and get the majority and make sure the Trump agenda goes on? What do you want to be, folks? Absolutely. So this is what I'm saying to you. I, I can't promise you very much, but I can promise you two things. If you just sit back and cross your fingers and hope for the best, that's a big risk, folks. And if you blow it, I can promise you that your children will live in slavery in this land. I can promise you. But if you win, and I think you can win big in this election, folks, you imagine how easy it would be for President Trump if he had three or four real good conservative senators in there to increase his majority and he didn't have to rely on Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins and those pseudo-Democrats. You imagine if he had another eight or ten Louis Gomez in the House to back him up Imagine what President Trump could do with just a few more good conservatives like Tim, Con Tim Donnelly, for instance, in your house. A few more decent senators. Is that possible, folks? Absolutely it's possible. Because I tell you straight, that last election proved to me that God is not finished with this country yet, folks. So this is your choice. Have a holiday, sit back and trust to luck. Or you can give it everything you've got for your God, your constitution, your country and your family. And if you give it everything you've got, people, put as much commitment as you can to the next two, three elections, but especially this one, the one coming up, if you give it everything you've got, one of two things may happen. One is you may try your darndest and we still lose. But at least you will earn the right to look your children in the eye and say, I did everything I possibly could. What is that worth to you, folks? And if you win, and you can win, absolutely you can win, you will spark an economic boom like you have never seen, people. The taxes will keep coming down. That border wall will get built. The, the regulations will keep coming off. And you will have a huge influx of capital and resources into this country to spark an economic boom that you've never seen before. And better than that, you'll, you will have maybe a 6-3 or even a 7-2 majority on the Supreme Court. You'll set the Supreme Court up for decades. You'll spark a liberty revolution in this country like you've never seen. And that revolution will spread across the globe, people. Don't you think the French want to be free and the Germans want to be free and the Indians and the Australians and the South Africans and the Brazilians? Well, they are looking at America, people. 
And they understand that if America goes down, the light goes out everywhere. But they also understand that if you recover your constitution and your economy, that's going to spark, that's going to help them all over the world, folks. That's going to fire them up to throw off the political correctness and the totalitarians in their countries. If you do this right, people, you have the chance to give your children not just an amazing country that you inherited, but one even greater. Is that worth fighting for? So I want to say to you folks, thank you so much for what you do for America, for my country, and for liberty. God bless America, and God bless the Tea Party. Thank you very much. Yeah, <clears throat> so I'm going to ask this question, uh, assuming that everything you say is true and I'm 100% uh, for what you said, and I do that. The challenge that I have, and I'm curious to know because I feel so discouraged about it, what I can do about it, and clear what your answer is, is that anytime I try to talk to anybody, who I feel I could bring over because I, I love and I'm totally supportive of the policies that Trump does. But it's so discouraging that every time he opens his mouth, he shoots himself in the foot. I have never heard anybody who is so, I don't even know what the word is, but so self-sabotaging by the way he conducts what comes out of his mouth in his tweets. So my, and, and I, I can't even talk to people about it because all they do is, is respond with his personality. What can we do about that? It, it, well, well, look, President Trump does make you cringe occasionally. But, but he also, look, people, but I don't want him to stop tweeting because you imagine if he did, he, he wouldn't get any voice out there at all because that's what keeps it going. You know, I think... And you've got, to take the bad, you've got to take a bit of the bad with the good. Look, I'll tell you what, love him or, you know, there's a lot of people out there who they may not like Mr. Trump particularly, or they may not particularly like the Republicans, but they love someone who fights and says it like they think. Right? And, and yes, you're right, you know, a lot of people do get turned off by that, but there's a whole bunch of people, and they proved that in the last election, he said, well, I might not tell my neighbours I'm going to vote for him, but I damn well am. <laughs> so we aren't going to tame Trump. You know, nobody can tame him. And I, and I actually don't want to tame him. Um, I want President Trump to go on and be regarded as one of the most successful presidents since the, since the thing. And I think that's possible. And I'm going to get out there. Look, I was not a Trump guy. You know, I'm telling you, right up to the last moment, I was not. But when it came down to Trump and Hillary Clinton, there was, no, there was no question. And my big problem with Trump is I didn't think he would do what he promised. That was my worry. And he has proven time and time again, he hasn't done everything I want, but he's done a heck of a lot more than any other Republican I can remember for a very, very long time. So... Um, Look, I'm going to ride this wave as long as it goes. And if he embarrasses me a few times on the way, well, I'm going to take that. You know? Um, yeah, I wish he could sort of shoot first and ask. We, we wish he could be a bit more judicious sometimes. But if that's what the price we have to pay to get the stuff we've got, I'm willing to pay it. You, you just have to focus people. Don't worry about what he says. Look what he's done. Is black unemployment the lowest ever since history? Look, look, his numbers right now on economic management are in positives now for the first time. The Democrats, there's an article today, the Democrats can thank their lucky stars that the midterms are before the next tax return. Because <laughs> when people fill out those tax returns and say, well, I'm paying six grand less than I was last year, I wish it was this year, you know, I just wish it was. So look, it's touch and go. We can blow this and regret it for the rest of our lives, or we can win it and work hard and have the fondest memories we've ever had, you know. Who, look, 
all the work you did, all the work you ladies and gentlemen did, was it all worth it on election night 2016? Yes. Absolutely. Would you do it all over again to get the same result? Yes. Absolutely. Well, keep that thought in mind. Got a question from Bob here. Um, at the present time, there's no requirement to show uh, citizenship in order to vote in a federal election. There's no re requirement for documentation. Now, well, uh, yeah, yeah, in this state anyway. Yeah, yeah. No, this is nationally. Okay. Yeah. Um, why? What I'm wondering is why the conservatives. Well, I was told that it only requires a majority of the House and the Senate in order to pass a law saying you have to be, uh, you have to show documentation in order to register to vote. Yeah. My question is, why aren't the conservatives in Congress pushing this law to be passed since it's so critical? Yes. Well, well, because, okay, so you've got the, the Democrat Party, which is controlled by communists. You've got the Republican Party, which is a third big government progressives who love what the Democrats are doing about a third constitutionalists and a third who wouldn't know how to tie their own shoelaces, right? You look, you don't have a majority to do it. You don't have a conservative majority because too many of these rhinos would love Obamacare. They would love amnesty because the Chamber of Commerce would give them all sorts of big fat checks for it. So you don't have the majority. Why did the Republican immigration bill not pass this, this week? They couldn't get the numbers. That is why we need another eight or ten good guys in the House and another six or eight good guys in the Senate. See, you don't have to get all of it, you just have to be the biggest faction. When President Reagan got elected, the Republicans hated him. President Reagan was banned from Ohio in 1976 by that state's GOP because he was a crazy right winger who would discredit the GOP, right? But once he got in, and he had a few people around him, and he started getting a few victories, the go-alongs to get along started going along with him. Now, once President... You're already seeing this in the Republican Party now. They're going along with him. The more successes he has, the more they're going along with him, and the smaller the, the rhino base is getting. But we have to make this election a great election, not just for Republicans, but Conservatives. I'll tell you what, if you had ten, 20 Ted Cruz's and, and Louis Gomez in the House, you would get those bills passed. You would absolutely get them passed. But right now, you've got a razor-thin majority in the Senate. He doesn't even have a majority in the Senate, because you cannot call John McCain. They, they're joking. When John McCain leaves the Senate, there's a good chance that uh, Arizona could go Republican. Right? <laughs> you know... He doesn't have the majority, and you've got to get that majority. So, you know, because we just don't have enough conservatives. We've got too many damn rhinos. I'm coming over on the other side after this question, folks. Since when did America become such wusses? Holy cow, he said some bad word or he said something wrong. I mean, John Wayne wasn't <coughs> like that. Clinton wasn't like <laughs> no, that. That's right, that's right. I mean, maybe they weren't yeah. good at words, but they were sure good in action. Look, you know, some of the things he says embarrass me a bit, and I don't always agree with all of them. But look, I don't think, I think it actually helps us more than it hinders us. And you, sir, may find people who get put off by it, but I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people out there who go, yeah, right on, I wish I'd said that. You know? People hate political correctness. And this is the first president who's actually broken through that barrier. And we should be very grateful for that. Hey, ISIS would be still having slave markets every day selling women and children if it wasn't Donald Trump. Absolutely. He took care of that Absolutely. in a number of, of a short few months. And Obama, year after year, it continued and be continuing now if it wasn't for Donald Trump. Absolutely. You tell your friends that, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm really puzzled. Okay, we've been we've been here for three years. We came from Bakersfield, which is very conservative, and I was really I really went through culture shock at the last election because not only are they predominantly Democrat in Laguna Woods or they're militant. Yeah. What my question is this: 
a large percent, you didn't talk about the Jewish vote, a large percentage of the Jewish people are Democrats, yeah, and, I, and, I, and, and when I try to talk to them, like one moment, just a couple of weeks ago, I said, well, look, all we've done, you know, for Israel. And you know what her response, we had a long conversation, you know what her response to me was? He's only doing that because he wants to build a Trump Tower there. And all the Well, who cares, as long as he does it, you know? This is similar answers, you yeah. didn't mention them. What are you supposed to do to answers like this? Look, um, I got a friend, I got a Jewish friend, and she was quite conservative, but she always hated guns, right? She hated the Second Amendment. And she hated, she just did, she didn't like guns. She'd never been used to them. She did, so one one person said a very simple thing to her. He said, he said, Deborah, how do you think the history of the Jewish people would have been different had they always been armed? And that resonated with her. Well, you think you tell the Jewish people that you know. <coughs> Look, there may come a time in this country where you are a persecuted minority again. If you lose the Second Amendment and your gun rights, how's that going to go for you? Do you think it's worth preserving the Second Amendment so you can defend yourself when the time comes? I don't think they see it through. You know, like, and, but the Jewish vote is slightly, slowly changing because President, a lot, a lot of American Jews don't particularly care that much about Israel. That's strange, but that's the way it is. But there is a substantial minority that do and have previously voted Democrat and they are shifting now because they are very, very pleased. So I think the Democrats' vote's going to go from 80% Democrat probably down to about 65% Democrat, then continue to, go, to change after that. I think there's hope there, but it's going to take a little bit of time. But, you know, and I think the black vote's going to change similarly in the Latino votes. Look, people will have to under, put it back to their survival. Every one of the Jewish people you know, I'm sure they've had relatives who are in the Holocaust or some other, or came here because of the pogroms in Russia or something like that. Why, did, why were they able to do that to you? Why did the Tsar's troops persecute you in Russia? Why did the Nazis persecute you? Because you didn't have any guns. Why can't they do that to you in America right now? Because you can have guns. Well, why me? It's a good insurance policy to keep those guns. And I'll tell you what, Donald Trump's going to protect those rights a lot better than any Democratic president you can think of. We have a question from Asha up front here. Our excellent presentation. This is very, very good. We are really grateful that you are here. So this is what we need to hear. Now my question is, how are we going to get the people who are not here to listen to you? Uh, see, it is the ignorance which makes us lose elections, obviously. And uh, secondly, we are not doing our part. Um, this is ridiculously critical for your grandchildren, really. We really need to work hard. That's one thing. Second point I have is uh, the way I have voted and supported candidates which were good for the future of America. Not uh, whether I personally like or whether I don't like his mannerism or her mannerism, nothing like that. Yeah. What is good for country, who has vision and who is taking us forward. Yeah. See, we want to get America back, so who is going to do that? Yeah. You know, so that is what we need to do, and personal choice and likes, dislikes aside. Yeah, yeah, look, that's number two. And I don't like Trump's hairstyle, but that's exactly. not going to stop me voting from. But I do have one more point. Uh, which is, uh, you know, how do we make people, uh, this is as a number one priority, that any time we are sitting with friends, neighbors, we need to bring this point and discuss about Trump and uh, Republicans, what we are going to do. Uh, you know, we have to do that because time is very short, really. So please guide us there. Thank you. Yeah, look, it's a good point because, see, the, the, I don't fear the left. What I fear is our base not turning out. I fear our base being too darn complacent. President Trump's got it, don't worry about it. I can just watch TV, watch football. I voted back then, I don't have to vote now. I don't have to, you know, it's all, it's all handled. Well, it ain't all handled. It's nowhere near being handled. So we have to use every opportunity we can in our communities to, to spread the word. But I think you have to get into organized political resistance. You have to get involved. If you're not in phone banking, 
get involved in phone banking. If you're not in door knocking, get involved in door knocking. You have ample opportunity in this district. This is one of the most critical district districts in America. It could be won or lost by 100 votes. You know, you can absolutely make the difference in this area. Just by getting involved, door knocking, phone banking, send 100 bucks to the candidate, whatever. But the most effective way to win votes is door knocking. The second best is phone banking. And you can all do that, people. Every one of you. If you don't want to do it, think about what you're going to tell your kids in 10 years' time. Are you going to say, sorry, I lost the country? Or are you going to say, wow, look at what a great country you've got. Aren't we so proud we pulled it off? What do you want to remember, people? So you, you can absolutely do it. And I'll, I'll just promote the movie too, because you know, we've all got a liberal uncle, or we've all got a liberal aunt, or a liberal granddaughter, or whatever. And Ann Coulter had this crazy liberal um, Bernie Sanders supporting aunt in Los Angeles. And Ann could not convince her she is going to vote for Bernie. Bernie's the man. We showed, the movie, showed our movie in Los Angeles. It's got a big segment about Bernie the communist in it, and he is a communist. And somebody brought the, uh, the, the, the niece along, and she sat through it to her credit, and at the end of it, she texted Auntie Anne and said, I understand what you're saying. I'm going to vote for Mr. Trump now. So you get some people around, you know, just look this. And I wouldn't even worry about liberals so much, but there are, many, there are thousands of people out there who are basically patriotic Americans, who know there's a few issues we've got to deal with, but really have very little clue what's going on. They are the people you want to bring around into your living room, show them the movie, and say, look, are you going to vote this year or not? That's what I would do. Hey Trevor, what do you think of some of the things we've heard uh, in the past months where the, the religious Christian crowds are coming out in such a small percentage to the voting booths People like Craig Huey, maybe even your friend Malcolm oh, McGowan has right. pointed yeah, yeah. about getting the, the Christian religious waking them up because with, with a modest number of them coming out, yeah. we can overtake even with the illegals voting. Yeah, look, the, the Christian vote in this country, and, and a lot more of them voted for President Trump than were expected, and that was a big shock to me. You know, because I think they understand this country's got to be saved, and they understand that. In the Old Testament and that, there were some people who weren't exactly angels that did great things. And they are very willing to, un they're very willing to be tolerant. As long as you're doing the right thing, they'll be very tolerant. Look, th this, is my, this is my basic argument. Because you've got a whole bunch of Christians who say, we shouldn't get involved in politics, it's not our deal, we don't have to be involved, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, I, I say this, you know, your first commandment is to love God and thy neighbour as thyself. So you say to them, look, if your next door neighbour is starving and you, you do nothing to help, is that being a Christian? They'll say, oh no. If your town is being flooded and people are going down to madden the sandbags and try and stop the waters and, you know, try and stop a disaster and you sit at home and refuse to help, is that being Christian? So if you are living in the greatest country the world has ever seen, a country with a constitution inspired directly out of the Bible, and it's going to hell, and you do nothing to help, is that being Christian? How do you have the world's greatest country, the country that has spread, spread, done more to spread the gospel across the world than any other country, by far, that is in big trouble, that's going to moral decay and ruin, how do you think you have this great country given to you and you have no responsibility to maintain it? How do you figure that one out? If you are given a wonderful farm, there's lots of examples in the Bible, you're given a wonderful farm and one brother lets his farm run to rack and ruin and one looks after the stock and builds the fences and does everything great, which pleases God more? Which pleases God more? Well, if you've got the greatest country the world has ever seen, a constitution inspired out of the Bible, the light of liberty, the light of the world, the light of the gospel all over this world, 
It's in huge peril, and you have no responsibility for doing anything to save it. How does that figure? Where's the logic there? I think Christians have more responsibility than any other. They say politics is a dirty game. We should get involved. Well, of course it's a dirty game because the good people aren't in it. No. And I'll say one more thing on this. Back in the 50s, Lyndon Johnson introduced the Johnson Amendment, which banned churches who had non-profit status from commenting on, uh, from endorsing candidates. That's all it was. And that gave all these gutless pastors the excuse, oh, I don't want to offend half my flock, I don't want to do this, so I'm not going to take any more moral stands or get involved in any form of politics from now on out. So that was in the 50s. About eight years later, they took prayer out of schools. Nine years after that, they passed Roe v. Wade. Do you think they were connected in any way? Do you think? Had the Christians been fully engaged, do you think prayer would have ever gone out of schools? Do you think they ever would have passed Roe v. Wade? They all hate abortion, yet it was Christian in action that allowed the abortion laws to be passed. I think there's more hope now of returning Roe v. Wade under this president than any other I've ever seen. Wouldn't it be great for Christians involved to get involved and actually see that happen? There are tons of arguments, people. Christians should be absolutely involved, more than any of us. I get a bit fired up about that subject. My next movie, hopefully if we get it funded and made, is going to be Enemies Within the Churches. The Marxist infiltration of the churches. Yeah. So if anybody knows a multi-millionaire who would like to put some money towards that, let me know. It will only take about a quarter of a million bucks, so it's not that much. Well, yeah, a couple. Like I can talk all night. I'm just mindful of your time. You know, and I want to get Dennis in here too in the end too. I got a question here from Mike. So Trevor, I got involved uh, with the election because. Um, I was born in Holland to parents that saved Jews during the Second World wow. War. Well, great. I was named after the Jew that was saved. And I saw where this country was going into darkness. And I believe that we're in, in the midst of a titanic spiritual battle. Yeah. And I joined um, and became, by some miracle, um, became leader of Christians for Trump. Great. Uh, okay. uh, long okay. yeah. And, um, um, what I'm seeing, and I see what you're saying about this, and I saw that so many Christians, one of the things that we wanted to do in L.A. was this thing called Viva Trump. And I said, you know what, I think Trump is, uh, he's got a big enough ego, we don't need to do that. Um, Christ, you know, in my religion, it's Christ shall be on top. And so I asked if we could have a banner called Viva Christ, Viva Trump. And we walked with that banner downtown Los Angeles taking territory. Right. And I never thought that I would ever be in an election. Now I'm walking downtown LA with Viva Christ, Viva Trump, yeah, leading a Trump man, train. And, and all of a sudden this guy comes up with a camera and he says, what's the story? And I'm telling him. And I said, where are you from? He says, I'm from a TV station in Spain. And I'm giving my testimony about Christ and it's being picked up in Spain. And, and a yeah. few weeks before, I didn't even want to be part of the election. Yeah. But God can do all things. And I believe that we're in the midst of something that needs to happen. And I'm, I'm sorry to go on here, but I believe that something needs to happen here um, to reach the youth and yeah. also to reach the Hispanics, who actually, the majority, are pro-life and pro-family. Most of the shift now. From Most of the Hispanics are more conservative than the Anglo population. Yes. So Thanks. my question is, um, there's a lot of connections that I have with Christian organizations that I believe that we can get them to vote if we use media in a proper way. And it's not a Republican issue, it's not a Democratic issue, it's a God issue. And can we maybe talk about the movie? I have people that can find Okay, well, well, we'll talk after for sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, look, you know, I think, was, what was your name, sorry? Bob. Michael, yes, yeah, sorry. You see, look, you know, America, you imagine had the pastors of today been the pastors of 1776. 
you'd all be still speaking with British accents, people. <laughs> because, you know, they say that revolution was fought over taxes. Well, yeah, a little bit, but it was really fought because hundreds of thousands of people had left Holland and Britain and France and Germany because of religious persecution. And they came to America so they could practice freely. And when they saw King George starting to reach into their communities, they could see the writing on the wall. They were not going to have the religious liberty that they enjoyed taken by a foreign king. And that's why you had the American Revolution, in my opinion. And so, you know, that, that's just, just how it is, you know. This country will only be saved if the churches wake up. Because it isn't, as you say, it's not a Republican thing or a Democrat thing. This is a good versus evil thing, ultimately. And which side do you want to be on? And I know where you all stand, <laughs> but you need to fly. The, see, you, flow the, you flew the flag, and millions of people around the world saw that. We've all got to fly the flag. You've all got to be bold, because courage is contagious. You're courageous. You will spread. People will follow you. You know, so I, I think it's, um, we, can, we can win this, people. We can win it big time, but we've got to stand up and not be lazy about this and think of our children's future, people. We've got a question from Dick Palmer here. Yes, we've got to give Dick a question. Yeah, I have a personal issue, and a lot of people have the same problem I do. I have seven kids, and some of them are Democrats, and some are conservative Republicans. We can't even discuss politics. <laughs> and everybody has that problem, I know. But I, I, I'm just lost in how I can convert them. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> well, see, this is the thing with your family. It's too personal. It's too emotional. And, and I'll tell you something else. It's a lot easier to talk to your grandchildren than your children. Because you and your grandchildren have a common enemy. Right? Okay. And, and they will listen. Grandchildren will listen to grandpa or grandma, but they won't let you, you. You bet you didn't listen to your dad very much either when you were, you know, when you were a young man. So you try and get around it. Talk to your grandchildren, talk to friends, and really leave converting your own children to others because it just gets emotional and they won't listen and sometimes it divides families unnecessarily. You know, that might seem like a bit of a cop-out, but that's, that's how I see it. You work with the ones you can work with, but don't try and force it down. Just say little things every now and then. Ask, ask questions, but don't try and ever preach to them. Well, you're right about grandkids. Yeah. Oh, I bet they are. And I'd be very proud of granddad, I guarantee it. Very proud of granddad. I, I know Joan has, she's been waiting here, so I'll let her get in, and then I think Dennis wants to come up. Yeah, uh, I read a very interesting uh, uh, well, uh, article, I should say. Uh, this was in the uh, Sunday LA Times, which I'm not too fond of, but um, this was an editorial by a, a gentleman by the name of John Wu, I who is Chinese, and he was indicating that uh, he could not understand why the Asians were so interested in voting Democrat. Yeah. And he commented that what Harvard has done, and I don't know if people here are aware of what Harvard has done, but the fact is that they are limiting the number of Asians. That they yeah, yeah, take. yeah, that's right. Uh, because they and pass the exams too much, so they're yeah, more well, they're, as racist. They're down to about 19.4% or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But he had commented that if they took the Asians as they deserve, uh, with their grades and all the ac extra activities they do, it should be over 60%. Yeah, and his comment was 
that he is going to uh, go after the uh, Asian group yeah. and remind them about the fact that why are they voting? Yeah, that's a very good point, you know, that Harvard is, because too many Asians were getting to Harvard because their grades were so good, so, that's, so therefore examinations are racist. So they're limiting the number of Asians to go in and give it to other minorities. Which, you know, but, but the, this is the thing. So you've got the Asian communities in this country were almost all conservative 30 years ago. But what happens? They educate their children. And where do their children go to college? They go to college where they're indoctrinated with left-wing garbage. And so they come out. Now most Asians in this country are voting liberal, especially the younger ones. So um, one of, you know, there's a couple of things we need to do is, look, the other thing is, you know, th there's all these surveys, you know, young millennials love socialism. They all 40, 50 percent believe in socialism. Well, but then they ask the question a different way. They say, do you believe in a system where, where most of your wealth is taken from you and given to someone who hasn't worked for it? And then the percentage goes down to about 12 percent. So it's in the way you frame the argument. And Mr. Wu is quite right. If he can convince the Asians that they are going to lose out from this political correctness, they're going to lose their opportunities. It's no point working hard and getting great grades because you're not going to get into the school you want anyway. That's what happens now in South Africa. You can, if you're a white person in South Africa, you can get the best grades, but they're going to give that position to a black person because that's how it is. So... The other thing is, um, you know, Ronald Reagan, you know, how many 60s hippies became great conservatives because of Ronald Reagan? You know, the, 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 the economy and the idealism, I bet there's one or two in the room. Well, if, if we can get the economy pumping and get Donald Trump winning three or four elections, a whole bunch of these Bernie kids are going to move out of their mom's basement and actually get jobs and mortgages and have families. And they're going to forget about the socialism pretty darn quick. But if we keep going down this path, we're just going to get more and more of them. And there's two things I want to, three things I want to pressure President Trump to do in the next term. First is, you get rid of tenure in universities. Second, no more state funding of student loans at all. It only drives the prices up. Third, abolish the Department of Education. And fourth, re-emphasise trade training for most young people. So you can actually be a plumber and make big money rather than getting a huge student loan and learning basket weaving at your local community college. You do those four things, this country would be transformed really quickly. Now I think Dennis wants... Oh, oh, so it was lady over the back, then we'll give Dennis a shot. Dennis Jackson. Jackson. Well, yes. Where is Dennis? Well, yeah, this is it. Over here, but she's up. I just want to make a pitch. There are five people in this room, Pat English, Dick Palmer, Donna, uh, Herb, that walked precincts in the primary. Guess what? There were more Democratic votes in Laguna Woods than there were Republican votes. And I'm talking about absentee. They have officially will yeah. uh, count them by July 30th. But we need to get Republicans in Laguna Woods to vote. They're not voting. So please sign up with me. I'll be here in September with my with my clipboard. I'll give you the precinct sheets for your street. If you could just do one page of Republicans and decline the state, we could win. And we need to win. You've been very inspiring. I don't understand why the Republicans are so stupid that they don't know what you've been telling us. I mean, it's impossible. Yeah, well, well you, 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 Exactly right. Just think, okay, you can give up a Saturday, you can give up some time, and you can phone bank or door knock, and it means you're going to make a sacrifice to do that. But you think what it's going to be like on election night if you win. It's going to be worth it, is it not? Is it going to be worth it? And if President Trump gets a second term, is that worth a lot of hard work and sweat to get that? Absolutely. So I'm just going to move down here. If people want to See, uh, talk to me about the books or the DVDs, that's great. Dennis is going to say a couple of things. But one comment, just one comment. Oh. We, we need some of our 
write up from you so which we can take to churches. We have to reword so that they do, you know, what you just discussed. Well, you, you email me and remind me and I'll work on something. I just want to say, I want to thank Dick for inviting me here. I, uh, the only reason I do what I do is because people like you are doing what you're doing. So I'm very proud to be amongst you and very grateful to be invited to speak to you. So thank you very much. Dennis Jackson, we're like to say, Jackson is the producer of Trevor's film. Okay, before I lose you, um, I'd just like to share some thoughts. I, I met Trevor in July of 2014 in Redlands. I'd never heard of him before. I have been involved in politics. He got up and gave his 90-minute speech. He reminded me of talking to my dad when I was a kid growing up. And he mentioned that after he was done speaking, that his book, which is 700 pages long, all right, the first 200 pages go through what he's talking about tonight. The last 500 pages, here's Maxine, all right? Now, she was on Drudge Report today, in Peach 45. Okay, Omar Navarro is going to run against Maxine, all right? Uh, Mike, Mark Takano is in San Bernardino. Aja Smith is running against him. Kimberlyn Brown is running in the old Mary Bono seat against Raul Ruiz, who snuck in there a couple elections ago. And all of these people, I have talked with them, and we are going to use enemies within. The opposition research is right there. And you guys are saying, why doesn't the GOP get involved? Yeah. Well, because some of the GOP guys are rhino enough, and when you have a Republican listen to Trevor, if they don't get ticked off, they aren't a good Republican. All right? It's kind of a, a litmus test that I use. So I heard Trevor speak, and he said that we're going to make a movie. Well, I'm not a rich guy. I grew up in Pico Rivera, California, you know. And uh, uh, I, I sent off for the information. And in October 2014, I sent him a check. I did not know it, but I was the first investor in the movie. I talked to a couple of my friends, people like you. A couple of them got together. The second and third check went in. They went to CPAC. And with that money, they made the trailer for the movie that was going to come out before the election. By the time the movie came out, 70% of the money for the movie came from guys that I knew. And because of that, I'm on the movie as the executive producer. Because that's, that's, that's what I guess the executive producer does. He raises money. I didn't know that. You know, I just was in because I wanted The movie came out eight weeks before the election. And you couldn't get it anywhere, although all the time was booked. That movie has not been seen that much. Now, if you want to know what to do with your family, the people that you don't know what to say to, because maybe they're too close, you give them the movie. If you like what Trevor is saying, and you're trying to figure out how to get it out there, I hope to meet the, this Friday Trevor with the GOP County Chairman of Riverside County. Because two of the Congress people that I'm talking to are running, and they're going to use, they're going to, I told them to drop Trevor's name, to take the 8 to 10 pages opposition research on Maxine Waters or Raul Ruiz and use it. Call him a socialist. Call him a communist. Quote him verbatim. Let somebody go, holy smokes, you're saying that? And they say, yeah, just, ch just check enemies within, Trevor Loudon. Just tap dance away. When we were meeting with the investors, they were saying, well, what's going to happen if the movie comes out and people protest? Well, what, what if they hit you for slander? Everything in this book is documented to where it can be put into evidence in court. So I told the investors, that's the best thing that can happen to us. You know, we can take them to court and prove what's in the movie in the courtroom. And they are going to want to do that because they know their background. They know they were, they were in these communist brigades in the 60s and the 70s, but the press has given them a free pass. So if you want to help Trevor, you know, please, buy all these books. You know, there's no speaking fee here tonight. You know, buy the videos, buy five, buy ten, give them to your family, run them around. Just don't be bashful about it. The truth shall set you free, and 500 pages of this book is talking about people in the Congress that he mentioned by detail as to why they couldn't pass the background check. What is the cost? The, the book's 35, the DVDs are 15.
But let me let me say this kind of in closing. You know, I, I get wound up over this, but uh, uh, you have a lot of neighbors. All these Democrats you're talking about when you're walking the districts. There's a lot of blacks. There's a lot of Mexicans. I grew up in Pico Rivera. You know, half my student body was brown. The rest was kind of white. We didn't have any blacks. But you know what? They've got kids that are in the military. They fly the flag. They love this country. They have no idea the Democrats they're voting for are selling this country out. And if they would, if they would know that Pete Aguilar, who got elected to Congress two years ago out of Redlands because he was the mayor there, that he was being supported by a political pack that had been on his website for six months, that was founded by a KGB operative. The only reason for that pack is to diminish the military strength of the United States and the people that they have supported were John Kerry and a whole host of other people, Ted Kennedy, and they find new people that they can get behind and now they were getting behind Pete Aguilar. You don't think some Democrats would say, hey, my kid's in the military and I'm voting for Pete Aguilar? They would have voted for the other guy. They just don't know. So we need to make them know and we, you can get them to know by you know, supporting Trevor. So that's all the more I have to say. Thank you for being here tonight, and uh, please help Trevor out. Thank you.